Well, uh, let me begin by thanking you for the invitation to speak at the event. Uh, I'm a miner's son from the Shropshire coalfield, and I've got Welsh blood in my veins, so it's uh, very pleasant for me to speak here tonight. We all know that the social sciences are under attack. Now, this has led a number of social scientists to formulate statements about the inherent public value of the social sciences in a way that goes beyond accounts of their economic usefulness. Now, in this talk, I will outline my own view of the public value of the social sciences. However, I argue that we need more than enthusiastic statements, what I call grand narratives of public value. Because social science itself needs to change in order to realize its public value. We've spent so much time criticizing the rise of neoliberal universities that we've overlooked the responsibility uh, to critique ourselves. What I call the new public social science puts my notion of public value into practice. And in so doing, uh, helps social science respond to the complex problems and challenges affecting the future of humankind in the 21st century. And I will illustrate this with reference to some of my recent work in formulating a new area of social sciences. And I'll end with some preliminary reflections on the public value of what I call the sociology of peace processes. <clears throat> but before I outline the new public social science, I must um, refer quickly back to my depiction of public value. Uh, since uh, the new public social science only makes sense in the context of the public value it seeks to realize. <clears throat> now, there are different types of value. I referred to use, price, and normative value. Now, normative value is an evaluation of social worth. It involves judgments of the esteem involved in possessing something. Now, this can be entirely independent of its price and use value, of course. Now, it comes in private and public forms. In its private form, it describes the worth an individual places on something. Its public form is the worth society places on it, which, again, can be independent of any individual's private estimation of worth. Now, the normative public value of social science, its worth to society, is that it nurtures a moral sentiment in which we produce and reproduce the social nature of society itself. Social science, therefore, enables us to recognize each other as social beings, capable of living only with each other in social groups, giving us a sh common responsibility for our shared future. So public value is more than the social and cultural relevance of social science research. Significant as this is. It's more than its policy engagements, as profound as these can be. And it is greater than the many cognitive accomplishments and learning skills that we derive from a social science education, plentiful as these are. Put simply, the social sciences not only generate information about society, they are the medium for society's reproduction. They are the way in which society finds out about itself and in so doing generates the very idea 
of society itself. Now, use and price value are located in the immediate here and now of current time and current space. <clears throat> uh, public normative value, however, is attentive to our humanitarian future. And part of the moral sentiment, part of the sympathetic imagination that social science garners is its capacity to alert humankind to its potentially threatening future. And it's this that makes social science relevant to the 21st century. The social sciences are engaged in the big issues. The big issues of future, industrial, scientific and economic change. Issues like sustainability, like environmental justice, like climate change, demographic shifts, labour migration, organised violence and peace processes. But even more significantly, these future changes will be mediated by the capacity of the social sciences to hold a mirror up to society to enable it to make sense of these changes. So social science becomes a public good for its own sake. It does so for two reasons. First, because it cultivates this moral sentiment, this sympathetic imagination through its subject matter, through its teaching, through its research, and through its civic engagements. Enabling us, as I said, to reproduce the very idea of society. But secondly, social science is a public good in its own sake because it makes itself relevant to our humanitarian future. Because it understands, it explains, it analyzes, and it helps ameliorate the fundamental social problems stored up for us in the 21st century. Now, there is nothing inevitable about social scientists practicing this form of social science. As recently as the 21st of November, seven umbrella groups of the world's leading research intensive universities including the Russell Group, signed up to what is described as the Leiden Statement. Now, the Leiden Statement promotes the contribution of the humanities and the social sciences to what is referred to as global challenges. It redirects our gaze two global challenges and recognizes that social science is at the heart of understanding them. But what the Leiden statement did not say, and this is my main argument tonight, is that social science has to change to meet these challenges. So I want to outline the new form of public social science that I see as necessary to put my grand narrative of public value into practice. Now I'm going to uh, summarize the new public social science now in a way that embeds it in my depiction of the public normative value of social science. So there'll be a slight repetition. But that repetition uh, it can be useful to reinforce the argument. The new public social science studies 
as I said, the social nature of society. The way in which it is produced and reproduced in culture, in the market, and in the state. The way in which we generate information about society, about culture, the market, and the state. That informs society about itself and the big issues that shape its humanitarian future. And this, I argue, simultaneously promotes moral sentiments. It promotes a sympathetic imagination through uh, garnering a body of citizens educated to social awareness, educated to an appreciation of the distant, marginalised and strange other. So in all of these ways, social science teaching, social science learning has civilising, humanising and cultural effects. Now, we all know that social science is both theoretically informed and empirically driven. It's committed to developing evidence-based observations, evidence-based descriptions and evidence-based explanations, both through uh, 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 theoretical investigation and empirical investigation. <clears throat> so social science, as we know, is explanatory rather than just descriptive. It combines theoretical insight and empirical rigour. <clears throat> now the research agenda of the new public social science is distinguished by applying these scientific skills to the analysis of the fundamental problems of culture, the market, and the state in the 21st century. Now, this is more profound than it sounds. Since the problems of the 21st century are complex, since they have technical features incapable of analysis by a single discipline, since they're not even the responsibility of any one branch of science, the research agenda of the new public social science privileges post-disciplinarity in a way that distinguishes it from traditional social problems research. Now, I mean by post-disciplinarity more than the ritualized calls for inter- or multi-disciplinarity. Post-disciplinary social science is problem-orientated rather than discipline-oriented. It has it, uh, disciplinary ideas of a both theoretical and empirical kind, used in combination as the problem determines across all branches of knowledge. So problems are no longer defined in terms of the received wisdom of individual disciplines. They're defined more by the technical features required to understand, analyze, explain, and ameliorate them. Now, I am only too pleased when post-disciplinarity elicits a reaction along the lines, well, that's what I do and many others do. I'm merely suggesting that we want more of it. Now, this post-disciplinarity may or may not involve collaboration with others across disciplinary boundaries in multidisciplinary teams. This is, after all, what normally inter- or multidisciplinary uh, disciplinarity means. It may involve, instead, <coughs> single researchers moving outside their intellectual orthodoxies to themselves approach a topic from perspectives outside their own discipline. But 
Fundamentally, post-disciplinarity extends the range of collaborations to include other branches of knowledge in the humanities and in the natural and medical sciences. We need to transcend branches of knowledge, not just um, cognate disciplinary boundaries. Now, again, this may or may not involve large research teams with disciplinary skills combining to deal with the various technical features of a problem. It could involve single social scientists becoming familiar with the humanities or natural science or medical research. For example, transgendered sexuality can no longer solely be understood from within social science. It requires biological and medical knowledge. Neurological research animates some anthropological studies of culture now, and certainly some sociological studies of child behavior. Behavioral economics is pushing the boundaries of our understanding of market behavior by returning us to ideas now out of favour in social psychology, but which explore the cognitive and effective basis of decision-making within economics. In my own field, the study of organised violence, of genocide and post-conflict recovery, which is uh, now popular in the social sciences, in international relations, uh, transitional justice studies, political science, <coughs> social psychology, even in what is now called conflict economics. <coughs> um, this uh, uh, field uh, sees healing as a medical and a social process, relevant to the human and the social body, not able to be accomplished properly within the confines of a single discipline, but must involve broadening out across branches of knowledge to trauma studies, cognitive science, medicine, victimology studies, and, and the like. Now, as well as being problem rather than discipline-focused, there's another distinguishing feature of the research focus on fundamental social problems. This is its collaboration with governments, NGOs, civil society, and different forms of publics. We have to collaborate widely in what is researched, the way it's researched, and in the proposed outcomes of the research. So in the new public social science, research becomes participative, in which research questions are not defined solely as the preserve of professionals. I describe it as generating co-produced knowledge. So public social science needs to be co-produced with the publics that name it as public. Now, there's a, a fear here, of course, of the loss of research autonomy. Uh, 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 that research autonomy is associated with traditional disciplinarity. But I argue that this, this fear at the loss of research autonomy is secondary to involving publics in our research to generate co-produced knowledge. The key question, of course, is which publics are we to be responsible to? My view of our research agenda requires, I suggest, that the new public social science is open to insight from all stakeholders involved in a problem. This includes the very different kinds of publics associated with it. And indeed, some of these publics may well be regressive 
or using Jeffrey Alexander's phrase, uncivil. I think, for example, of research on, say, right-wing extremist groups or anti-peace movements. But other republics will be in positions of power, whom social science has kept at arm's length in the past. And let me dwell on this point for, for a moment. If big issues direct our attention, the multiple interests involved in these big issues require research agendas that successfully tap <clears throat> the impact on all parties and from all points of view. Now this means government as well as powerless and marginalised groups. It means business as well as NGOs. It means policy makers and civil servants as well as the underprivileged subject to policy. Now, of course, amongst the publics which we should be receptive to, which we should be engaged with, it is still our responsibility to speak truth to power. But we need to engage with power to do so. <coughs> whether this is government ministers, officials, civic groups, political parties, trade unions, business organisations, community groups, whatever. <clears throat> Therefore, theoretically driven and empirically engaged research on complex global problems transcends disciplinary boundaries as well as political boundaries. And the new public social science needs to rise above the strangers which social science has kept at arm's length in the past. So if big issues demand big science, I suggest on our part it also demands a big attitude. I mean by this we need to improve social science links with local publics, the sorts of local publics social scientists feel represent their more natural constituencies, but also with government, with policy makers, with international NGOs, people, as I said, normally considered as strangers. Now, the research agenda of the new public social science requires a further change to conventional research practice. Post-disciplinarity implicates different modes of communication and language. Once we interwork across the social sciences, once we interwork with other branches of knowledge, once we are in liaison with co-producers of knowledge amongst publics, we need to generate a common language. And on our part, this means lessening the use of in-group professional vocabulary. And it involves a stylistic change, I think. A stylistic change in which social scientists begin to write to make themselves understood rather than to make themselves sound complicated. We need to write for our publics, not just for professional acclaim. Now, uh, let me pursue this notion of public engagement just a little bit more, since it's quite central to the new public social science. One of the most familiar responses to the neoliberal emphasis on the need for universities to be publicly accountable <coughs> has been the demand to improve dissemination. 
Dissemination is presented as a form of public engagement. It's said to be the method for garnering impact. And thus I want to forcefully assert that civic engagement is more than dissemination. In the new public social science, civic engagement begins with the formulation of the research problem. When different publics can be involved as co-producers in the uh, design of the research. Civic engagement also enters into the teaching strategy of the new public social science. When we involve civil society groups, international NGOs and other um, publics, involve them in the classroom as well as uh, providing placements and field trips outside the classroom so that we lessen the gap between the classroom and the real world of big issue problems. So civic engagement in the new public social science is not left as the final outcome to be done at the end. <clears throat> the odd piece of popular writing and the odd workshop amongst um, the uh, um, researched communities. Dissemination and, and uh, civic engagement are different processes. Dissemination involves communicating the results to broader audiences, whereas civic engagement involves holding conversations with relevant publics at all stages of the research, at all uh, stages, the beginning as well as the end. I also suggest that civic engagement is <coughs> a strategy for the classroom as much as for uh, 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 research. Now, one of the reasons why public social science is at once difficult and profound is because it challenges the boundaries between normative and scientific practice. I think that traditional normative social scientists don't like the idea of public social science. <clears throat> they don't like it because it challenges their preference for what I call the naysayer role of critic standing on the, the uh, outside, criticizing, pointing to limits, pointing to constraints, pointing to difficulties. Public social science challenges this naysayer role <clears throat> because uh, traditional normative social scientists know that in order to make a difference in people's lives, uh, they have to engage upwards to powerful publics rather than just downwards to the organic publics we feel more comfortable with. Others dislike it because the focus on big issues risks their detachment. It threatens to get them involved and engage with problems that have clear moral dimension. So I want to address this tension between normative science, uh, uh, between uh, normative social science and scientific social science. And I want to emphasize that I do not see the new public social science as involving a simple, mutually exclusive choice between science and normative practice. The new public social science is science with a normative dimension. It is moral commitment scientifically undergirded. Now, of course, the public value of social science, as I've described it, is explicitly normative. The way I have constructed this public value, which is, as I said, the cultivation of moral sentiment and a sympathetic imagination towards each other, 
as social beings with an ethical concern about the humanitarian future we all face. This, this depiction, this grand narrative of public value makes it particularly normative. The new uh, public social science that's predicated on this grand narrative of public value cannot avoid being normative. Indeed, it's designed to be normative. It's designed in order for social scientists to live ethically and to act politically in their practice as social scientists. But I claim that public social science is still science. Its normative and its scientific dimensions can be easily reconciled. So that the new public social science is scientific through its commitment to the idea of science, by the way it separates values from evidence. And this means that public social scientists with value commitments with senses of ethical responsibility should not distort the evidence for the sake of these values. And it also means that the new public social science needs to continue to reflect on, its, on methodological issues, on its research practice, in order to better improve its science so we can better engage with its ethical responsibilities. And if I can be <clears throat> permitted an aside here, I believe that Weber's notion of science as a vocation <clears throat> is greatly misunderstood and it serves us ill in the 21st century. <clears throat> Weber's maxim <clears throat> is really a maxim to accompany the professionalization of the social sciences in the 20th century. It's no longer, I think, an appropriate maxim for the 21st. And this is why, incidentally, I have also lectured on the need to replace science as our vocation with a new maxim which I call society as a vocation. <clears throat> but even with society as our vocation, social science remains scientific. But now the commitment to science is accompanied with an ethical responsibility to promote the social good. And Weber, I think, would not have uh, disagreed with this. Well, let me begin to conclude by bringing us to the sociology of peace processes. <clears throat> Public social science is about creating global citizens. Global citizens with a responsibility to our shared humanitarian future. And I see my reconceptualization of peace processes as very much the sort of public social science I've outlined here. So it's part of the same intellectual project. That project being to define a new type of social science suitable for the next millennium <clears throat> that is capable of addressing issues <clears throat> in a way that helps social science respond to the threats engulfing our humanitarian future. In the case of the sociology of peace processes, I suggest it makes it better capable of understanding the nature of peace processes, the sorts of issues they throw up for analysis and amelioration. <clears throat> so in short, and I'll expand, but in short, public value of the sociology of peace processes is that it helps societies that are emerging out of conflict make sense of themselves. Helps them respond to rapid social changes provoked by peace. It helps us understand the structural factors that privilege some groups 
and disadvantage others in peace processes. <coughs> I'll expand on that. Uh, but first let me explain why we need this reconceptualization. Peace processes are normally approached from the standpoint of political science, international relations and human rights law. The emphasis was upon the introduction of good governance structures and thus on institutional reform. So peace building was in effect turned into state building. And the assumption was that once problematic politics is sorted out through these new governance structures, everything else falls into place. Society will naturally, over time, become reconciled to itself and to its past and be healed. <clears throat> now, such an approach is naive. And I distinguish between the political peace process, which, as I've just said, concerns itself with institutional reform to introduce new governance structures. I compare that with what I call the social peace process, which is about reconciliation between erstwhile protagonists. It's about relationship rebuilding, or cross a communal divide, it's about civil society repair, it's about the replacement of brokenness by the development or restoration of tolerance and compromise. Now these concerns that, that, that uh, define the social peace process are either ignored by negotiators in the political uh, peace process or are assumed to follow naturally from the signing of a peace accord itself. Now, the sorts of actions that focus the social peace process include things like truth and reconciliation procedures, forgiveness and atonement strategies, uh, policies that promote um, and encourage public tolerance and compromise. It involves new forms of memory work, new forms of memorialization and remembering. It, it involves public apologies, new cultural symbols. Uh, uh, and the, the, the reassessment and reevaluation of identity. Now, if we focus our attention on the political peace process, that is, on governance structures and institutional reform, the domain for its operation and implementation is naturally political. Peace processes become the responsibility of governments and of political actors that make up or aspire to be governments. But once we recognize that there is a social peace process, peace processes become everybody's responsibility. And the domain in which they function and are consolidated widens to include civil society. So the social peace process thus depends for its progress on the empowerment of civil society rather than on state building. Now, the aftermath of organized violence and civil war puts difficult demands on post-conflict reconciliation. But I think that these are precisely the sorts of issues that threaten our humanitarian future in the 21st century. So they represent uh, you know, a good example of what I mean by the, uh, the um, the uh, new public social science. But let me anticipate an accusation from you of inconsistency. As I emphasized, one of the marks of this new form of public social science is its emphasis on post-disciplinarity, where the nature of the problem determines the perspective, not approaches from within closed dis disciplinary boundaries. It's <clears throat> now. The sociology of peace processes, as I envisage it, is inherently post-disciplinary. For example, sociologists of peace processes need to link up with mental health specialists when dealing with post-trauma growth, say. Or with computer scientists and electrical engineers when we explore cybercrime and its role in organized violence. Or we link up with public health specialists when considering uh, the medical health issues of children born of rape or HIV AIDS. 
Or we link up with, say, drama and creative art experts when we explore the role of performance art in helping people manage the problems of dealing with the past. So uh, we, 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 we uh, engage with theologians when we reflect on the meaning of political forgiveness. We engage with planners and architects when redesigning for shared space or geographers when conflict transformation impinges on territory and borders. So the social peace process is inherently post-disciplinary. So why then, you must be saying, why call it the sociology of peace processes? My defence echoes that of C. Wright Mills. He wrote a very revealing second footnote to his book, The Sociological Imagination. And in that footnote, he wrote that he was describing an approach for the whole social scientists, the whole social sciences, and that he had first thought of entitling the book The Social Studies. But it changed his mind, he said, because he was a sociologist and it was the discipline he knew best. Now, I suspect you see that as a weak defence. Perhaps a more accurate phrase for my work therefore might be, quote, the new public social science of peace processes. But I hope you agree that that's too much of a mouthful. But whatever we call it, whatever we call it, what is its public value? Its public value is to create global citizens with a responsibility for our shared humanitarian future. This affects the teaching of peace processes. It affects the kind of research topics we address. It, it affects the, kind, the sorts of civic engagements we undertake. And this co-produced knowledge is well suited to the study of peace processes. As we engage both upwards with governments and international agencies, as well as downwards with victims and survivors. And this civic engagement must also include what we might call the uncivil parts of civil society. We must engage with ex-combatants, with dissidents, with spoilers, and other opponents of peace. So I come to uh, my end. The capacity of the sociology of peace processes as part of the new public social science to garner moral sentiment, to garner a sympathet sympathetic imagination, it is essential in uh, the sociology of peace processes. As researchers, we must empathise with the people who are affected by violence. We must encourage our students to empathise with the, those who are having to undertake the difficult task of learning to live together after violence. We must create a sympathetic imagination that helps us understand that some people suffer the consequences of violence and live in a state of fear and anger as they try to develop a shared future with former enemies. <clears throat> so, in all of these ways, we create a global civic awareness about people living in societies emerging out of conflict. And so the new public social science of peace processes does have a normative public value. And it can be summarised simply. It is to try to make a difference to the lives of ordinary people who are struggling with the aftermath of conflict. To try to make a difference by empowering them to realise justice, fairness and tolerance. And I think that societies emerging out of conflict need public social science more than most other societies. And this, because the sociology of peace processes helps them come to terms with their violent pasts and assists them in, in inheriting a more peaceful future. Thank you very much.